Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to one of our most important panels during our annual meeting. Uh, we're so privileged to have distinguished representatives here from the U.S. Senate, uh, the House of Representatives, and two governors. And uh, hopefully, after this discussion, uh, we will understand more about the U.S., U.S. politics, and the role of the United States of America in the world. And America really matters. 25% of the global GDP comes from the U.S., and 5% of the global population. So this country has done pretty well. And it's still doing well if uh, you look at the economic outlooks, also that the uh, World Economic Forum produces. We are uh, pretty bullish on the U.S. Uh, there is a lot of innovation. Uh, there is still a lot of growth. And uh, we, if there is a recession, we don't predict that. But if there is one, I think it's going to be shallow. But also 45% of the global military capacity is still with the U.S. So uh, if the U.S. Decide, decides to take side, the U.S. Uh, decides to get involved, it really, really matters. So in Europe, we have always thought about the U.S. as an exporter of uh, predictability, growth, values, and principles. And I think uh, a lot of the world still is of that view, but we know that there is also not always that um, there is agreements in Washington, D.C. And that's also in any democracy. Um, there uh, is uh, disagreements, but um, I think the feeling has been lately that there has been a lot of partisanship uh, in the U.S. So we wonder how can things get done on behalf of the Americans, too. One thing is to take responsibility for the world, but um, it's also very important uh, to get things passed, I guess, both uh, in the House and in the, um, in the Senate, uh, to also make things happening. Uh, and this is also means a lot for the state. So let me uh, start with you, uh, Senator uh, Kunz, here on my left side. Uh, there was uh, a lot of legislation that was done um, in the fall. We heard also President Ursula von der Leyen today address the IRA, the Inflationary Reduction Act, uh, a lot of infrastructure investments, a lot of investments also uh, in decarbonization. Do you expect now with a Republican majority in the House, a Democratic majority in the Senate, that there will be new legislation and new things happening in the next two years? or? Is it now only going to be about the next presidential campaign? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for the question and uh, for the recognition that even in a 50-50 uh, closely divided Senate, uh, even in a period of great partisanship, uh, that in the last two years in the House and Senate with Democrats and Republicans uh, working together, uh, we passed landmark legislation uh, to help uh, fund and modernize our infrastructure, to help deal with unmet needs for our veterans, uh, to help uh, with chips and science, investment in uh, manufacturing and in reshoring, um, and many other bills. A, a remarkable array of legislation in just two years. Your question is, now that we have divided government in Congress between uh, the House and the Senate, will we get anything done? We have to. Uh, the American people expect it. It will be a little more challenging. Uh, there will be some uh, big issues, uh, the debt ceiling, for example, where we may struggle. Uh, but if you look at the rest of the world, uh, we recognize, those of us who serve as governors of states, as members of the House and Senate, uh, we recognize that while we have divisions and differences, at the end of the day, we have a responsibility, as you put it, to continue being an exporter of values and stability. I do think we'll find broad agreement about the importance of um, strengthening our alliances, um, competing effectively with China, and supporting Ukraine uh, in its ongoing war against Russian aggression. There's many other things we can discuss, but I thought I'd start on a positive note by highlighting a few things where I think there's some agreement. And, and on, I, I think there's a lot of questions there on, on Ukraine. Uh, will there be continued support also uh, in the coming year on Ukraine uh, from the U.S.? 
I believe there will. Um, at the end of last year, uh, we passed uh, both chambers and sent to the president uh, legislation that provided another $45 billion in support, humanitarian, economic, and military. Uh, and Ukrainians are being trained in the United States at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, on the Patriot system that uh, President Biden has now approved transferring to Ukraine. Uh, the brutality of the war in Ukraine, uh, the violence of it, its very imperial nature, uh, has not just brought together our allies around the world, but mobilized Americans. There is, I think, a reasonable expectation that that spending uh, will be accountable, that there will be transparency about it. Um, but I think there's other things that we are going to have to tackle. Uh, gun violence, um, uh, refugees and immigration and the border. There's a number of members here who've been active in bipartisan solutions to those challenges as well. And I know uh, Senator uh, Manchin and Cinema has also collaborated on, on the RRA and other initiatives. But f first, um, uh, to uh, you, Senator Manchin, we all watched the speech of um, President Zelensky um, that addressed the both of the chambers. Do you think that changed anything uh, in the Congress? Uh, do you think it changed things in America, that speech? I, I, th I think it solidified an awful lot of the support that we've already had. It helped an awful lot for him to come and recognize all that the American people have done uh, in support in, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the commitment that we have is, is unending. We're going to stay with Ukraine, Ukraine until they are victorious. I think that's a, not only for Ukraine, but for the entire world. It's important, especially the EU. Uh, so we're very much committed to that. And uh, the energy it's going to take, basically, uh, the uh, Putin usually weapon, he weaponized energy. So with Putin weaponizing energy, the United States has to step to the plate. And we have to backfill with LNG and all different things we can to help our allies. That was the whole purpose of the IRA bill that we have in, in America. That bill was passed basically on energy security. I know it's been touted as an environmental bill, but I think we're all responsible to decarbonize. But you don't eliminate, you just don't eliminate what the world is using. You use it and innovate it and you do it better. That's what we're trying to do and all of us work together on that. And I think it's going to be a very, very uh, monumental bill that's going to endure for quite some time. And hopefully that we can uh, be able to be in a stronger, more independent and secured. The United States cannot be the greatest economy in the world and we cannot be the superpower of the world if we don't have energy security. Energy independence and security maintains that. And we have to depend, look around the world for someone to do what we don't want to do for ourselves. And we have all the resources to do everything that we can and do it better. I think it's a shame we didn't. So the IRA gives us that pathway forward. But Ukraine, I don't know, I've never seen support more solid. You hear a few people on both sides, uh, maybe questioning, should we continue down this large. I think we're in $100 billion or more right now in support. Uh, but I can tell you, my vote will always be to support Ukraine until they are victorious. Thank you. I, I was also wondering, uh, Senator, what do you think will be the biggest topics for the Senate and for the House well, in the two coming uh, well, you, years? Well, you have to look. I mean, we all know, and I think that uh, Senator Sinema, Senator Coons, everybody, if we had uh, immigration, uh, the United States, we have to have a, a, a strong, robust employment, but you have to have legal immigration. You cannot have an immigration discussion unless you have border security. And unless you're committed to border security, we're not going to get that done. So if that's going to be it, don't waste any time. If we have to do permitting, we can't meet the goals that we need to be energy independent unless we can get the job done. And you can't get the job done in the United States if it takes five, seven, and ten years to permit something that takes two and three years, even in Europe. So we've got to change that. We think there's some, some deals to be made from the standpoint. The main thing about negotiation is you can't get everything you want. You know, you can try to improve it. Now, if you're improving it, do you take that as a win and move on to the next? Or do you say it wasn't good enough? So you let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's not who we are. Senator Sinema, uh, you're from Arizona. I guess immigration is a big thing uh, in Arizona. It is, and unfortunately, Arizonans have suffered from the last 40 years of the federal government's failure to address this crisis, um, which is why this is something that I've been spending so much time and energy working on this. Folks in, in our uh, participating in this panel tonight might know that 
uh, in the winter, just before the Christmas holidays, Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina and I um, put out a immigration framework that both addresses security issues around creating a secure border so we can deter individuals who want to bring dangerous drugs and criminals into the country, which, by the way, are happening, that's happening on a nearly unimpeded basis right now because we do not have the personnel, we're not utilizing the technology to effectively stop this type of crisis um, of drugs and, uh, and dangerous individuals entering our country. But we also need to reform the asylum system. Right now, we have an asylum system that actually creates a pull factor for criminal cartels in South America to bring individuals to this country, to our country, who have no legal basis for a permanent path to citizenship. So we want to combine that with also making changes to our system to create a path to citizenship for DREAMers, to ending the visa backlog so that we can actually hire the talent we need at all edges and across the entirety of the spectrum. So Senator Tillis and I proposed this framework right before the Christmas holidays. As most folks are aware, we ran out of time to push that legislation through because of the budget process. However, we came back in early January, and just last week, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, a border senator and myself, led a delegation of four Republicans, three Democrats, and myself an independent to the border in both Texas and Arizona. We began talking about our framework, and we are building the bipartisan coalition that we believe will allow us to pass legislation through both the House and the Senate this year. Thank you. Um, one thing I was reflecting on is that a strength for the U.S., if you know, compare uh, the demography uh, between the U.S. and, for example, China, where you see no um, labor force is going down for the That's first right. time. While in the U.S., the demography is still uh, quite favorable. So by 2050, uh, America still will be as young as today. But it is also changing, and we know there is lack of labor. So who do you think about this? You know, the U.S. was the land of opportunities. Most of you have, like, very diverse backgrounds. Who, when you also need people in the years to come. Will you then let people in and on, and on what premises if you're stopping know your borders? So the key is to create a system where we get to choose as a nation who we will invite into the country and who we will not. Right now, because our immigration security system is completely broken, we're not choosing who gets to come and who doesn't. The cartels are choosing. And that is not sustainable for our country. So in order for us to have a system where we are bringing the best and the brightest, whether it be farm workers or J-1 visas for doctors, or whether it be geniuses who can help us create the new ideas for the future, we need to be in control of that. And that means reforming the system so that we can actually identify what jobs we need filled and then choose who are the kinds of folks we want to come to our country while also making sure that we're keeping out criminal elements and the dangerous drugs that have created an ever-increasing and concerning fentanyl crisis. I expect our governors could talk more about this fentanyl crisis than anyone else on this panel because they're suffering through it every single day. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, uh, Congresswoman Maria Salazar, um, uh, Florida, a uh, couple of questions. First, on uh, Ukraine. Uh, do you confirm the same as uh, Senator uh, Manchin and also Kuhn said? Do you think there will be the same support also uh, from uh, the new uh, House as it has been in the past? I think that's, thank you, and thanks once again for inviting us uh, to this panel. I do believe that there is a heavy discussion within the GOP for what you are saying, specifically among the, the Republican members of Congress. But I'm one of those, I am Cuban American, first generation, so we know what the Soviets and the Russians can do to you. I'm very good friends with Victoria Sparks, who is the Ukrainian American. Uh, sole representative Republican of the Ukraine people on the floor. And uh, I do believe that regardless of any discussion or doubts of the $100 billion that we have um, uh, donated or given to the Ukrainians to defend themselves, we will at the end vote, at least my vote is secured, to continue with the Ukrainians until they win. The United States saved Europe. And, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that the Ukraine, the situation is, is very important for this part of the world because we are here in Switzerland. And, um, and, um, and, and it puts things into perspective that for the Europeans, this is a very important issue. 
For the United States, it's, it's an issue that we, we're going to repeat the same thing. We're going to liberate Europe, uh, quote unquote, in 2023, just like we did in 1945. We understand that that is our duty. Although there is, um, that there is uh, some doubts in some members of the GOP on the House uh, if we should continue, because we have so many issues that we need to pay attention to uh, at home. And one of them is immigration. So I just wanted to use this, this opportunity that I would love to work with uh, um, Senator Sinema and with other, the other senators on the House, because I agree that immigration is one of the major problems that we are facing on our, on our shores. Uh, there's no way that the United States can continue being what it is, the number, most important power in the world, the number one economy in the world, if we don't have hands. And I represent the Hispanics, which are the largest minority in the country. We're 23%. And the overwhelming majority of the people who are crossing the border as we speak are Hispanics, Latinos like I am. And uh, this nation, and I believe that people like me in Congress should be the ones telling uh, the rest of the political elite that it's time for both parties to pay attention to something that for the last 35 years, either party has been able to do, which is to pass complete overhaul of the immigration system. Because not only we need those hands, like the Congress, like us, a senator was saying, but we need to also give dignity to those people who are in the country. And those are the people that I represent. We're talking about 13, 15 million people who are most of them Hispanics, I would say 85%, who speak my language, look like me, and sound like me, that are contributing with the economy of this country, and they live in the shadows. So it's time to seal the border, like she said, put order, let's see who comes in and who doesn't, and then turn around and give dignity. That doesn't mean path to citizenship, that means to include them and make them dignified members of our community. Thank you. Uh, just a, a short question on this uh, seal the borders. Yes. Uh, since you also have a Cuban uh, background. If there are Cubans then fleeing from Cuba, uh, shouldn't the U.S. receive them if they're fleeing from uh, also political uh, persecution and all this? And in a system where you should pick and choose, where does this with political, uh, you know, uh, difficulties. You know all the Jews that came to the America and seek to also protection in the run-up uh, to the Second World War. You received them all, and I, I think it's gone pretty well. Yes. I, I represent the city of Miami, the heart of the Cuban exile community. So that is the question that we face every day. The United States laws say that you have to go through due process. And not only the Cubans, but the Venezuelans and the Nicaraguans, Nicaraguans are confronting the same thing that the Ukrainians are. Socialism and communism. And I do believe that we have to give due process of law to those people who are running the, those tyrannies and incorporate them and accept them into the country if they do face persecution. Thank you. A short comment from Senator uh, Kunz, and then comment. I go to uh, Congress. Just about our history. Um, shamefully, we did not welcome all the Jews fleeing Nazi Germany. In fact, there's a, a famous incident in a case of the SS St. Louis that sailed up and down the east coast of the United States being rejected over and over and ultimately most of those passengers were forced back uh, to Germany many of them perished and it was because of that experience that the United States helped lead uh, the development and ratification of a global treaty that says we have an obligation to allow those who are seeking asylum so um, I just want to say to my friends and colleagues the senator and the congresswoman um, we have a balance we need to strike between having a secure border and being a nation to which people come to seek a dignity and redemption, a chance at freedom, um, and getting that balance right, where we are, we have a humane um, system that allows for asylum, but that is also uh, legal and regular uh, and orderly. That's a tough balance, uh, but with leadership such as they've shown, I'm hopeful that we can achieve that. Right. So, thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to the two congresswomen, and then we're going to go to also the garners, uh, where the real stuff is happening. We'll, we'll just have to go the round in, in DC uh, first. I, I just wanted a short question to you, uh, Congresswoman um, Salazar, before moving to Congresswoman uh, Cheryl. We, we know that it took a little bit of time before, David, um, uh, you, you chose the new Speaker uh, of the House. Uh, so it, a couple of days or, or, or whatever. What, what, what has that 
uh, led to in the caucus, the GOP caucus. Has it changed anything? Is something uh, broken? Do you think this can be reconciled? Uh, do you think this will uh, lead to a different GOP in the, in, in the House uh, in the two years to come? Listen, it was three days. We were very tired, very frustrated. But I can say to you at the end that democracy worked. Democracy is messy. It's not always pretty. It's frustrating. Hey, Ma during the founding father years, Madison was fighting with Lincoln and Le I mean, not with Lincoln, with uh, Hey, you know, during that creating the Constitution, things it's a few were not years ago. Uh, yeah, like you know, like 250 years ago. Still plus. slavery around. Sure, but you know, the, the founding fathers just didn't like each other that much. But look what the nation they created and the Constitution they put together. So we're still, we're still experiencing, and I was there, so I, I want to share with you an anecdote. I, you can still see the American exceptionality coming up and flourishing. The, the Republican Party under Kevin McCarthy is a new one, because what he proved during those three very torturous days is that every faction within the GOP on the floor of the United States Congress is going to be heard including the, the freedom, the, mo the, most, uh, the most radicals, the most conservatives, including the moderates and the ones who are in the middle. And to the so everyone on the GOP is going to be heard. And we've had many conversations after those three torturous days that proves that we are going to be able to work in a bipartisan fashion. And I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be one of those voices. Yeah. No, I, I think we, we don't envy uh, Kevin McCarthy to, to keep no, that no. group together. I, I think that's going to uh, be challenging. But uh, turning to you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Cheryl, you, you saw what was uh, unfolding for those uh, three days. And I started to ask Senator uh, Kunz how he sees the possibility to get things done, both uh, in the House and in the Senate in the two uh, years to come. Do you think that will that process will have a lot of impact on the environment for getting things done uh, in the House? Well, I think what we saw was there are really two ways this could go. Um, and one is somewhat dire for the country, and one is really hopeful. Um, and by that, I mean, what we've seen over the, the past several Congresses, and this is not new, is a reluctance for a speaker to work with members from the other political party. So what I would have loved to have seen in this event, instead of reaching out to the very extreme members of the far right, if Kevin McCarthy wanted to strike a deal with the moderate members of the Democratic Party. That's not something he did. It's not something, quite frankly, Speaker Pelosi was wont to do, reach across the aisle. Um, and I think as we've seen the nation pushing us ever more towards moderation and towards bipartisanship with these tight, tight um, groups of people. I mean, the Senate was 50-50 was in the last cycle. We had a very slim majority for Democrats, now a very slim majority for Republicans. The nation's pushing us towards moderation. And yet, when you don't have speakers reaching across the aisle, you have them beholden to the extremes of the party, which is, I think, bad for the country and bad for the moderate center. So if McCarthy chooses to continue moving forward with these extremists, you know, I'm very concerned about the debt ceiling and what that might mean for our ability to raise it. Um, however, I think there will be opportunities for all of us in the House to work together um, to make sure that the, the must-pass legislation gets passed. And, and I think that could be really good for Congress and really good for the country. No, thank you very much. I, I'm turning then to Garner uh, Kemp of uh, Georgia. We know you well. We've seen you a lot of, on, on TV all over the world. Um, during the last elections, um, you um, were very uh, clear on some uh, principles. Uh, you were re-elected a uh, broad majority. Now, um, of course, there has been some reflections uh, why the Republicans didn't do better uh, in uh, the House, uh, uh, rep House election with, with representatives. And a lot of the candidates that were um, election deniers uh, were not elected. Any reflections on that because of your own background too? Because you came under some pressure, but you, you didn't really give in on that, did you? 
Well, I mean, look, I wouldn't want to try to speculate on, you know, every member, every Republican candidate for, for Congress or the United States Senate outside what we saw in Georgia. My own perspective is I think the people of the state that I represent, which is a great one, uh, they, you know, look, they want us to know, they want to know the differences between the candidates, but they also want to know what we're <laughs> for. Like, what are they going to get the next four years? And that's something that we just stayed focused on. And I think when you look at the, at the Republican ticket in the state of Georgia, um, we've had two record years in a row economically. Our mid-year numbers will probably break last year's numbers if you take out the two big mega, mega projects we had. We talked about the things that we did on teacher pay raises, on school security, our two health care waivers, even though uh, a lot of the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. was trying to hold those up. We had innovative solutions that are lower in private sector costs and bringing more access to people, uh, really pushing back to the one size fits all narrative that my opponent's been driving for literally six years now. And uh, I think people bought into that. They bought into a politician that, and, and I got this question at the end of the campaign. Uh, a reporter said, what's your closing message to people? And I asked the question to the voters, you know, look at the candidates and ask who's been fighting for you? Who was fighting to keep your business open when all the pressure from both political parties, from people in high places, from a lot of other people that were sitting in their basement on a computer was not to stay open, it was not to reopen our economy? Who was pushing to get our kids back in the classroom? Well, we did all of those things. And, you know, we proved that we were fighting for people. We were fighting for election security. We are fighting for people to have a good paying job and to have, you know, to survive, to li live, a, to fight another day economically in our state. Uh, we've fought for our people by giving them a billion dollars of their tax money back to help them fight through 40 year high inflation, because in my opinion of a lot of bad policies in Washington, D.C. And the voters of, of my state, the great state of Georgia, certainly responded to that. Well, thank you, Governor. Um, how does it look seeing it from uh, the capital, your capital, and looking at uh, D.C.? Um, there's a lot of partisanship, and of course there will be disagreements in a democracy, yeah. but do you think it has gone so far that it can be a negative factor for America now moving forward? Well, listen, I think from my perspective, a lot of frustration with Washington, D.C. I understand, you know, Senator Coombs' position on the IRA, uh, but, you know, that hurt Georgia-based uh, electric vehicle companies in our state. It was not treating them fairly. I believe the legislation picked winners and losers. Thankfully, I think the administration is working on, on fixing that. I don't think we were treated fairly in a state because we had been open. We had a low unemployment rate. So the level of funding coming out of Washington, D.C. and the current administration, we were treated differently from New York and California. You know, their citizens per capita were getting more money than ours and so that's frustrating to some someone like me as a governor that just wants to be uh have our citizens treated treated fairly you know there's frustrations quite honestly look if there's gridlock in washington dc uh one thing you can count on is the stability and a great economy a great business environment in the state of georgia and we're going to keep rocking and rolling but it is frustrating to have to deal with the fentanyl crisis because we simply cannot secure our border in this country. And I'm hopeful that something gets done, but you know, my advice, take it for what it's worth while we're waiting on that, just secure the border. I mean, literally every governor in the country is dealing with the fentanyl crisis. We're dealing with street gang crisis. We're dealing with human trafficking crisis. And those are the issues that we're trying to tackle at the state level. Uh, but I believe much could be solved, and I think there will be broad bipartisan support for simply, in the meantime, you, while you're working on these things, to secure the dang border. Thank you, Governor. Uh, moving to Illinois, uh, Governor Frisker, also re-elected, second term, increased your majority, uh, also um, in, um, in, in um, overall. Uh, and uh, we know that you also, uh, for this uh, re-election, uh, you were out there saying that uh, Illinois should be 100% based uh, on net zero or renewables by 2050. 
Was that something that was well received during your campaign? Extremely well received, and in fact, we passed a Climate and Equitable Jobs Act for the state of Illinois, which is significantly increasing uh, our uh, focus on clean energy. For We're actually going to be uh, fossil-free by 2050 in the state of Illinois. So uh, we are making significant progress, and I think in that vein, I want to disagree with Democrats and Republicans across this panel on something. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the desire for bipartisanship. I think that certainly if you ask the public, do you think that uh, Congress or that uh, state should work in a bipartisan fashion? The answer is yes. But what they really mean, in my view, is they want to get things done. And let me say about the current president of the United States, he has gotten things done. Now, he has worked with some reluctant members of his own party. He's worked with some uh, reluctant members of the opposite party. But we have gotten things done for the United States at the federal level under this president. But the truth is, not enough. Not enough. And so at the state level... What are level, you missing? Well, I, I think at the state level, and I think the governor would agree with me that, look, the people of our states want us to increase jobs, grow the economy, uh, you know, make sure that in my state people want to ban assault weapons, we just did that, um, protect a, a woman's right to choose, we just did that. Those are not happening at the federal level and should, uh, but we're doing it at the state level. And, and it's true also about building our economy. We, have a, we just passed a trillion dollar GDP for the state of Illinois. We're the fifth state in the country to do that. But we're doing that with some help from the federal government. But Frankly, we've had to chart a course and set an industrial policy, essentially, for our state. How are we attracting business? I think the same is true for Georgia. We compete with Georgia on some you know, important industries. The film industry, you're doing very well. We're coming up behind you in the film industry um, and, and, want it, and we'll be exceeding you soon. But, um, but, I would but, respectfully but the, disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the point is that I think people want to get things done, and especially for work working families, for, you know, creating jobs, yes, so businesses benefit, but also just lifting up middle-class families and working-class families uh, and people who rely on government. And that's something that, um, again, I think at the federal level for the last two years, uh, a lot has gotten done. Getting past the pandemic is, is a major, you know, talk about, you know, saving the economy and saving lives. Um, we did that at the federal level, we did that at the state level, but it's about getting things done for people saving lives and building the economy. For, for those of us that observe uh, the U.S. from outside, uh, there were a lot of speculations around uh, the elections to the Senate and uh, to uh, the House, but also on uh, the different um, states. It didn't really go uh, totally the way um, that was expected. Uh, is, has there been like a change in the zeitgeist in the U.S.? Uh, you know, things goes a little bit up and down because it was very partisan. And then you saw some candidates that were less partisan, maybe did better than expected. Uh, and we know that this has go, gone in waves uh, in the U.S. also in the past. Do you think things are changing in that respect uh, also in the run-up now? It still feels very partisan to me, I must does. say, um, even though, once again, you know, we find ways to work together to get things done. But, but, and you saw that again over the last two years. But it is very hard. I mean, especially when you have people who deny reality, um, who are holding office. You know, I mean, literally people who are, you know, believe in space lasers um, and, you know, sort of have strange views. We know views. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and have very strange views about, you know, about what we ought to be doing as a country. There still are people in the GOP caucus who are very pro-Russia. And I, I, I wonder about that in this day and age, in this moment. I, you know, it's not being critical of all Republicans, but I just don't know where that stuff comes from other than QAnon and I don't know. I th I, let me just say real quick, to the, the American people basically, I think, are tired and, and very, very upset with how the operations have been going, whether it could be in extreme states or extreme Congress that we have. Uh, the problem that we have is the open press system and basically all the platforms. So if you're able to have five platforms, social platforms, that you can basically um, personify the extremes, 
somebody who is extremely right or extremely left, and it seems like that is the majority speaking. They're not the majority, but they're basically driving everybody to make a decision. What side are you on? Are you on this side or this side? And in America, there's only one side, the American side. It's not the Republican side or Democrat. We should be coming together to solve the problems from a different angle. But the problems are the same. But the bottom line is we don't. We try to basically put blame on, that's your problem. That's not mine, so it's your fault. That's not who we are. Our democracy will correct itself. The public and constituents will command that and demand it, that we correct it and come back to that sensible center. So a short comment from a Senator Cinema, and then I go to Senator Cruz. Since last time we met, you, you become an independent. That's I think correct. Happened that same day or the day after, didn't it? So, as folks know, I have declared, formally declared my independence from what I consider to be a deeply broken two-party system. Those who know me know that I was always an independent voice and always have been for the things that I believe in and for my state and for my country. But I do think it's important to note that, the, that what you've heard about partisanship, I believe, is accurate. You know, in the, in the last two years, we, we think, you know, January 6th, which is a horrible day um, from two years ago, um, created, I, I think, concern and fear for every patriotic American across the country. But in the resulting two years, the Democratic Party um, shared a narrative that said we would not have any more free and fair elections in this country if the United States Congress didn't eliminate the filibuster and pass a massive um, voting rights package. As, you, as we all know, the filibuster was not eliminated. Joe and I were not interested in sacrificing that important guardrail for the institution. Um, that massive voting rights bill was not passed through Congress. And then we had a free and fair election all across the country. And as has been noted, the outcome of that election was different than many people expected. Most election deniers lost um, across the country. And individuals of both political parties, some extreme, some moderate, won. So we had a free and fair election. So one could posit that the push by one political party to eliminate an important guardrail in, insti in an institution in our country may have been premature or overreaching in order to get the short-term victories they wanted. And then we fast forward to where we are today, and we saw the House of Representatives struggle for multiple days in, the, in a row as Kevin McCarthy, dear friend of mine, had to, con had to continue conceding point after point after point to the radical right of the GOP to a point where he's now in an unenviable position that will make it very difficult for us to meet our obligation when the debt limit fight comes up later this year. Those are just two examples of the pull that you see political parties giving in order to get everything they want, rather than to recognize that the heart of a democracy is not just collaboration and working together, it is compromise. It is getting a lot done, but not everything you want done. And so I, I think that there's actually a really big opportunity right now for our country to have a reckoning of sorts and to see that perhaps these polls that are happening in the parties, as Mikey mentioned, neither speaker has ever shown interest in recent years of collaborating with the moderates and other parties because they go on my way or the highway did. Pelosi did it. McCarthy's doing it. This is, this is not healthy for democracy. So I think that this is an opportunity for us as, as a country to look back and say, is this partisanship serving us? I would posit to you that it's not. And Thank so while you. some would say that there were reluctant folks working in Congress in the last two years, I would actually say that that was the basis for the productivity for some incredible achievements that made a difference for the American people in the last two years. And we still don't agree on getting rid of the filibuster. That's correct. correct? Thank you. I, I was, I was uh, thinking about uh, Congresswoman uh, Cheryl. You, I had only one question to you, and I, we know, and at least I know, you also have uh, quite a distinguished background from the, from the Army. I think you even have uh, been a helicopter pilot for uh, the U.S. Uh, Navy. And um, we, we did speak about uh, Ukraine. We saw Afghanistan uh, pull out. We have seen now that uh, women and girls are not uh, uh, even uh, admitted to universities or schools anymore. When you look at uh, the U.S. Army with your background and also um, the challenges uh, the U.S. is seeing uh, from different parts of, of the world, do you think that the U.S. will continue uh, to keep an army 
of the size you have today, because as, as I started to say, 45% of the global military capacity is from the US, or should Europe, for example, be ready uh, to take a uh, bigger share of this for ourselves? I'm a member of the House Armed Services Committee, and I don't think you're going to have anyone on the House Armed Services Committee suggest that Europe should not be taking on a larger share of, um, of the defense community. Uh, but Europe is. I, I think what we're seeing now, um, for the first time, really, uh, for some countries, such as Germany, really getting heavily invested um, in the war for democracy and supporting Ukraine. We've actually seen, though, that's not just limited to Europe, what's going on around the world. Um, I was just hearing from uh, a gentleman from Japan about the recent uh, diplomatic relationships and, and the military relationships going on and building up J Japan's defense base, but also in concert with South Korea long-time enemies, really. Um, so we're seeing people coming together around the world in an understanding of how important it is with this global realignment that democracies come together to make sure that our, our defense is strong, really in order to provide deterrence against another Ukraine. And I, I just want to thank the Ukrainian people for their hard fight. I see Sasha in the audience, um, who's done such a wonderful job, a member of uh, the Ukrainian parliament, um, we have had what I call shuttle diplomacy from members of the Ukrainian parliament talking to us all the time about what it's going to take for them to win this war. And the support from the United States in conjunction with our NATO allies has truly been astonishing and I think really is a great scene setter for the future as we go forward together in supporting uh, national security and deterrence. Well, thank you uh, so much, and uh, I think it's significant what you underlined. When the third and fourth largest economy of the world, Japan and Germany, is deciding to go from 1% of GDP to 2% of uh, GDP to defense, that's a lot of defense. So I think the message is also received. Before I go to uh, you, Senator uh, Kunz, we have to wrap up this thing. And I think people, uh, at least I enjoyed it a lot. I learned um, also a lot. But uh, what I learned from politics myself, you should end when people still want it to go on. <laughs> and I, th I think I, I look at the audience. I think we're still there. I just want one question to you, Governor Pritzker, because you also have such a distinguished business background. What we are looking at the U.S. is, you know, inflation is starting to know, go down uh, for the first time. We see there is still growth. Um, the feeling, and what we hear here in Davos, is that the Fed was very late in increasing interest, and now they're very late in internalizing that inflation is on its way down. Is that something that you share? Well, their aim is to bring it down back down to 2%, as you know. Um, but I have to say my expectation is that that will take a very long time and that we can't rely on, you know, raising interest rates until that happens. Uh, that, If you want to see a massive recession, that's what it would uh, w result in. Um, but who can change that inflationary target, then? Well, what I'm suggesting to you is that there will be a... Uh, reduction, a continuing reduction of inflation, but it's not going to head to 2% in the near future. Um, but I do think we're going to have to live with a slightly elevated uh, amount of inflation. Just it's the nature of things. Look at the rest of the world. I mean, it's not that we're the only nation. In fact, we're probably at the lower end of so, most of the uh, developed world anyway, in terms of inflation uh, at this point. Um, but I, I'm optimistic. I am. I think that, that the U.S. economy, if we I don't know whether we'll get to a recession. I'm certainly hoping not, although we have to plan properly for that. But, uh, but my expectation is that it will not be a deep recession if there is one, uh, and that business is, um, though it may be uh, moderating, uh, we're not going to see a, a major dip. And we're not seeing massive job losses. In fact, there's still huge demand for labor, uh, and that is unfortunately one of the things driving uh, inflation. I saw, Senator Kunz, that you seem to agree, Governor Pritzker, on this. Yes. And 
Uh, but, but the inflationary target of 2% that is set as a target for the Fed is something that's politically decided. I guess the Senate or, 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 or the House could change that to 3% or 2.5%. You know, Ch China is not exporting uh, deflation anymore. So I do agree that I'm uh, optimistic that if we have a recession, it will be uh, relatively light. Uh, the independence of our Fed is a, a key part of our economic system, um, and they have, over many years, uh, managed our economy and our uh, banking system and our money supply uh, relatively well. Um, I do think that um, one of the things that continues to make the American economy strong and robust is innovation. Uh, our commitment to being a free and open society and economy, uh, one that welcomes uh, people of talent and uh, people in need of asylum from around the world, um, but frankly also our global network of alliances, um, those countries that closely share our values. Uh, that have been our partners uh, for decades. Um, I think one of the strongest things that President Biden has done in response to the aggression of Russia and Ukraine is to work closely with our allies around the world, not just in Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think in the coming two years, we'll see even more progress. Um, as you mentioned, Burga, uh, both uh, Japan and Germany are significantly strengthening their share of the defense burden. I also think um, Chancellor Schultz uh, had called for a climate club and we will begin to see some positive movement in that direction. If the United States can learn some lessons from Switzerland, from Germany, about workforce training and skills development, and we can find a way to move past some of the disagreements over the moment um, that are resulting from our current climate ambition, I think our partnership, our alliances will be stronger than ever, uh, and I think we have a very bright future together. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I'm, uh, after listening to this panel, we see there is so much competence uh, in the U.S. Uh, government. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to listen to you. You see it's uh, late in Davos. This, this uh, slot at 6 o'clock uh, is a tough slot, but you made it. You see <laughs> people are still here. They're getting late to their dinners, uh, but I think we're all so interested in where America is heading. And uh, thank you so much uh, to the panel. They deserve a big applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.